All right. Just checking that it's getting recorded, inshallah. All good. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah, we've begun a new series called Qada and Qadar, which literally means in English predestination, fate and destiny. The belief in fate and destiny in accordance with the Islamic teachings. And we mentioned last week many lessons. For those of you who were here last week, um, alhamdulillah, you'll understand the continuation today. You'll be more familiar with it. And as for those who've just come and joined us, this is our second class, our second episode on this topic. Uh, I can't go through the whole lesson last week. I'll try to summarize in a couple of minutes what we covered last week. But whoever would like to understand it further, get the introduction right, you can go back to the recordings that are on the Preston Mosque website or their Facebook page. It's recorded there, inshallah. The date is there. The caption is there. You'll know, inshallah ta'ala, the introduction to Al-Qadar wa Qadar last week. And today, inshallah, we'll continue. But just very quickly... What we talked about last week, we answered a few of the questions that confuse a lot of people about Islamic belief in predestiny and fate. I began by talking about how we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, exists. And then if He exists, then He must have created everything. And if He created everything, He is the beginning of everything. He cannot be created and he is the beginning and the end. If he created everything from non-existence to existence, then he must have full control over what he has created. He is the one who manages it. He is the one who predestines it. He is the one who is in control of it. Then we spoke about the arguments for it. Then we answered the question about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has predestined everything. And we mentioned four char characteristics of an Islamic belief in predestiny and fate. We said that when God created, or before He created everything, before He created everything, He knew every single thing. When, what will exist? Where will it go? How it will be? His knowledge can, has no bounds. Allah's knowledge has no bounds. And it is infinite. We mentioned a few verses of the Qur'an about Allah's knowledge. And there are many of them in the Qur'an. One of the verses we mentioned is the vastness of Allah's knowledge, so much so that He knows the hidden and the manifest. He knows what's inside your hearts and what's outside. He knows about the crawling ant on a, on a black rock in the middle of the dark night in the middle of a desert. He knows each leaf, where it falls and when it will fall and how it will fall and why it will fall. Nothing, nothing is beyond His knowledge. And then we talked about that Allah knows the past, present, and future. And for us as human beings, we are limited in our knowledge. We cannot get full closure over what happens in our life. Or sometimes we, things we have control over, some things we don't have control over. How do we approach it? So number one, Allah knows everything. And He knew everything. And He created the pen. We don't know what the... It's not like the pen that we use. He created the pen, a writing thing, a recording thing, its, it's, it's, its features and its description is known to Allah. And he said, it, said to it, write. And the pen said, what should I write, my Lord? And he said, write everything that will be till the end of time. And this happened before the creation of this universe by 50,000 years. Before the creation of everything, even paradise and hellfire, by 50,000 years, Allah knew Way before that and infinitely, he wrote it 50,000 years before the creation. Third thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then willed for everything to be. So after he knew what will be, he wrote what will be, and then he willed what will be. The difference is that when, you, when Allah wills something, it means he allows it, he permits it, he lets it be, 
he gives permission. Nothing can happen without his permission. And fourthly, after he willed it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it. Everything that you see unfolding before your eyes, or you cannot see it, everything that unfolds in this universe, whether it was billions and billions of, ye of years ago, billions and billions of light years ago, and to the billions of years in the future, Allah creates it to unfold and happen as time goes on. We said that Allah is the creator of time, therefore he is not bound by time. He is not bound by space. Therefore to Allah there is no past, future and present. So Allah knows it all. But to us we know because of the motion of time. We also said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave us some will in certain things and he did not give us will in other things. We have free will in certain things. Everything else we have no free will in it. What are the things that we have free will in? They are all the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to do. And because of that, he sent to us a Quran and revelations and prophets to tell us commands and prohibitions. He showed us the guidance. He told us about cause and effect. He said that you have control over your actions and you are responsible for the consequences of your deliberate actions. So anything God told us to do or not to do, we have control over that. Now, we answered the question, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had willed everything, how is it that I have control? Since it is only in God's control. He's the one who wills it, he wrote it. We answered the question, if God wrote everything upon me, how is it that I still have choice? We answered the question by saying, when Allah wrote what you will do, he didn't write it to make you do it. He wrote it on the basis that he knows what you're going to do. And we gave some examples about a child and a little fire. And we gave examples about digging a hole. And we gave examples about driving a car. We gave many examples about, we gave examples about the teacher. We gave examples about going into the future and coming backwards and writing what's in the future. It's not your fault, but it's, well, you know what's going to happen. So humans do things that they have control over. And Allah will hold you accountable for the things which you have free will over. But the things which you don't have free will over, Allah will not hold you accountable for them. You're born, there are certain things which are absolutely outside of our control. Such as the family you were born into, the gender, you're a male or a female, that's not your choice. Um, how long you will live, when you will, when you will, um, when you will be born, when you will die. Uh, how much sustenance you're going to get in this world, the opportunities that will be given to you in this world. All these are things which you have no control over. The sun setting and the sun rising, the universe, the solar system. All of that stuff is not in our control and therefore we will not be asked about it. We will not be asked about it. We also spoke about, we answered the question, um, if, uh, how, do I, how do I deal with, with suffering and consequences in my life? How do I deal with things that have happened, which Allah had willed and they happened, whether they were my choice or whether they were outside of my choice? And I mentioned four ways to think about it. Islam teaches us four ways to deal with suffering and things out of your control and within your control when they have happened. Number one, always think that God could have a plan for you or he has a plan for something else through this. So it doesn't happen for no reason. There is a plan. Or Allah has made it to test you. It's one of your tests in life for your hereafter. If you pass that test, you will benefit both in this world and in the next. You will get stronger. You will gain more things in this life. And in the hereafter, also you have earned it. Number three, it could be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring good out of this suffering or out of this thing. Maybe this has to happen in order for something better to come out in the future. Who knows? Allah knows. We don't know. And lastly, it could have been your own mistake, your own bad choices. And what do we do with that? We learn from them. Allah gave us free will with choices and he gave us weaknesses. We make mistakes. Why did Allah make us make mistakes? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to make mistakes? Because we are a learning human being. Allah wants us to learn and to understand. And we spoke about the purpose of life. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that through mistakes you learn good things. Allah did not create the bad except so you can know the good. Evil, you know the good. If there was no evil, you won't know the good from the evil. If, you, if, if there was no mistakes, then people will not learn things like empathy, forgiveness, mercy, goodness. They wouldn't appreciate what they have. Isn't that correct? Everything will just be haphazard and without a choice and without, sorry, without any purpose. And we spoke that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us successors in this life. And he told the angels and took pride in front of them of this human being, you and me, that we are successors, we are entrusted with this world. Allah wants us to learn about his creation, about him, about ourselves, about this world that surrounds us, about our relationship with him. He created us and we are able to make through our choices, great choices to rise in our piety and our righteousness even above the angels. Or we can make bad choices deliberately and make ourselves sink way below even the animals and lesser than the animals and some animals are even better than humans. So my brothers and sisters we have complete control over our choices of whether we want to obey or disobey, do good or do evil, lie or be honest and all that stuff. We answered many questions and inshallah we continue today. Very quickly predestination means where things have already been decided a long time ago where they will end up and they will not go anywhere else no matter what you do. They are decided by Allah. Qada and Qadar are two words we use. We said Qada means God's knowledge of everything that will be. And Qadar means Allah's will to create and make what he knows will be to come into reality. No one can change that. Because if you were to be able to change that, then God doesn't know everything. That's what you're saying. Where does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create, uh, record all this knowledge? We learned in the Quran, Allah tells us there is something called Allah al mahfuz the preserved tablet, the book of decree. Up with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't know what it looks like, what it is, but it contains the knowledge and the records of everything that will ever be and where it will go. That knowledge is only to Allah. We mentioned some Qur'an verses last week about Allah saying no one knows what is in it except He and whomever He wills to show. So He shows His angels some of these things that are in His book of decree. Why does He show His angels? Because Allah created the angels to carry out certain duties in life. Allah does not need the angels, but He created them to manifest His His, his um. Uh, his royalty and his power and also to show us that we are so important that the angels are also there for us and there's something about us as humans when we learn God has angels it's kind of like a connection a, a, a closeness between us and Allah and more to know who he is more to know about him subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not just an empty world there are angels, and Allah made these angels, they come to your house sometimes, they make supplications for you, some of them, they whisper good things for you, some of them, they write good and bad deeds for you. The whole world of the angels is another topic all on its own. So some things Allah reveals to the angels to carry out, and some things He hides from them. I want you to remember that part, because today we're going to talk about that, that the angels, God shows them and gives them orders from that book of decree, the place where He had all the records, and then they take it to carry it out. We're going to come back to that. So, inshallah, today I will now go through the questions that cause people confusions about qada and qadr. And it is compulsory for every Muslim to believe in that everything is in God's will, Allah's knowledge. He recorded everything, all the good and all the bad. Although it is just good and bad in our perception. But to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is good. But in our perception, Allah made us see good from bad so that we can run our lives in accordance with the way of righteousness and goodness. And so that there are two types, the ones who are, deserve righteousness and rewards and those who don't. It's up to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the path. My brothers and sisters, I want to answer one question that someone brought up to me and usually young people living in the West ask me this question. I don't know if it's because of social media or people are constantly in search. Um, I take it lightheartedly from the Muslims themselves, they should know, but unfortunately knowledge these days is not 
I mean, there's a lot of knowledge, but a lot of people don't understand that knowledge. They need to ask. So there is a question about karma and luck. How does that fall in line with qadr? That's our first question for today. Do Muslims believe in karma? Do we believe in luck? And here is the answer, inshallah. First, you need to understand what karma is. It's a Buddhist term. Buddhists are the ones who believe in karma, maybe even Hindus. And luck is just luck. Everybody hears about luck. We have qadr. That's all we have. We don't have karma and luck. We call it qadr because it gives the full meaning. But karma, I'm not going to go into a whole lecture about it. Basically, it is the Buddhist belief that there is no God. No God controls anything. In fact, they hate the idea of God. They don't like the idea that God commands you and tells you what to do. Instead, you humans are the ones who make yourself. And you are in complete control of yourself and your actions. There is no one who has predestined anything for you. You were just here. Don't know how. You've got control. Don't know how you had control. And there are laws in this world. Don't know where these laws came from. But they're here. And they have five laws. They call it the laws of karma. And um, they call it... Uh, let me just uh, quickly remember the name okay where did I write it so anyway the word karma means action and I know that a lot of you think that it means what goes around comes around and I'm going to answer that question as well is what goes around comes around true and is karma true so karma is basically laws and we'll just call them laws. I forgot the name that they use. They say there are five laws in this universe. The law that governs the solar system, the galaxies, gravity, things like that. The laws that govern action and consequences. You do this, this will happen. Cause and effect. The laws that govern that. There are the laws that govern our genetics and our biology and how the process of growth happens. Biology, uh, perception, instinct, how do birds know where to go in their migration, how does a salmon know where to go, the fish, how do human beings grow to love their parents, it's called perception and instinct, they say these are the laws there, they have the laws of um, uh, what they call um, the law of the many laws, but one of them is, which is very interesting, is called Dharma Niyamar which is the law of mysterious, non-egotistic processes. Mysterious stuff. So they give you all these laws, and they have one law, which is they go, it's mysterious. Nobody can explain it. And then they tell you, but you are in control, and you can rise and reincarnate until you become, you become the enlightened one, like Buddha. Buddha means the enlightened one. So basically, you're kind of like semi-gods yourselves. But Buddhists fail to answer the question, where did these laws come from? How, how is it that these laws govern all these things? Who put these laws into motion the way they are? Who put our genetics and biologies to run the way it does? Who put actions and consequences? Who put cause and effect? Who put these physical laws and who put these emotions and these, uh, from which we derive our ethics, right and wrong? Who put these laws into place? Where did they come from? What about those mysterious things that happen? An earthquake. Why? We don't know. You were there at the wrong time. They say it's bad luck. That's the best they come up with, other people. Or they say it's karma. All right. See, in Islam, in Qadr, all of these are fine. Yes, there are laws that govern all these. But who is the one who set these laws in motion and precisely measured them to do the things they do like that? Someone is behind it. Not you and me. We don't just pop out here and they're there. God, Allah, the creator of everything, put these laws into motion. Even in science, the scientists who believed in evolution 
evolution is a process. If all of it is true, again, there's no problem for Muslims. If it is true and there is evolution, that's how the world processes and grows. Who is the one that put the process of evolution into motion? God. Allah. And there is nothing random. We don't believe in randomness. We believe that Allah put everything into motion. But you see, the problem with people is this. They compare God to creation. We always think about God that he thinks like us. Allah is outside of all time, space and creation. How can you even conceive this creator God? I remember once at La Trobe University, back in my days when I was about 20, 21, I see a group of uh, Christian brothers and sisters. We say brothers and sisters in humanity, by the way, so we can be brothers and sisters in humanity. And they're talking about the Bible and uh, their version of the Bible. They had something called born again. So and uh, they adapted and sort of brought a new kind of way of thinking. Cutting the story short, I ended up in a debate with them <laughs> for about three hours. <laughs> Three-hour debate. It was my friend's fault. They go, come on, take them on. I said, this is not about a wrestling match, guys. They go, we want to learn. Anyway, I was young myself, younger. And they got me and I got hyped up. Started a debate with them. By the will of Allah, it wasn't me. It's the truth. But when you know the truth, you can say it better. Wallahi, there was about seven of them. Just simple questions. I won't go into detail. But there was this guy sitting with them. Or standing with them, who was an atheist. And they're trying to convince him that Jesus is the Son of God. And that he died on the cross for our sins to be... You know, forgiven and all that. And this guy wasn't buying any of it. Back and forth, back and forth, and I'm watching. Then I came in, this is how it started, and I started with the atheist. I said, brother, what's your name? He said, I forgot his name, Michael or something. I said, well, what's so hard about believing in the creator God? He said, you guys are telling me, he thought I was Christian, he said, you guys are telling me that this magnificent God has a son. And that this son died on the cross. If God had a son, he'd be a second God. And then he says that second God died. God dies. And God needs a son. I mean, if he's going to be God, he's got to be nothing like us. As simple as that. We have children. He doesn't have children. Otherwise, he is limited like us. He has needs and emotions and desires. You know? And I said, all right. So I gave him some analogy. I said, if an archaeologist finds a pot in the desert... And that archaeologist and his team or her team, they come up and they tell you about a civilization that lived here 4,000 years ago and they've never seen them, they've never met them. Just from that pot, they can tell you what language they spoke, how they dressed, their social systems, their um, beliefs, everything. Isn't that right? It, even though they never met them, from a pot. He goes, true. I said, all right. So look around you, you've got the tree, you've got the leaves, you've got the sun, you've got the clouds, the moon, yourself, your fingerprints. Doesn't, isn't this the pot of an archaeologist to show you who made it and who put it here? Surely it tells you something with your intelligence. And you know, he said, I can, I can, that makes sense to me. But I can't understand this magnificent God who's like this still has a son. So I whispered to him, I go, I'm Muslim. We say there is only one God worthy of worship. He has no son, no father, no partner, no wife, nothing in existence, nothing like him. And then he, wallahi, he got so happy, he said, that makes a lot of sense to me. He was giving out some pamphlets. He took them and started giving them out himself. So we turned around to these Christians and they said to me, how did you convince him? I said, well, I just spoke the truth. I said, so you guys are telling me as a son. and I mean, that's your belief, but is it right or is it wrong? So we're having an intellectual discussion. But my brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, by the end of it, the truth, <laughs> I don't want to brag about it, but alhamdulillah, it was really good that day. And, you know, 300 people, about, about 300 people were listening. Some of them converted. Some of the Muslims came up. I never knew they were Muslims. They didn't even look like Muslims. That's all very sad, you know. Like, when I say don't look like Muslims, they looked like anything but Muslim. Um, not that there is a particular Muslim look, but, you know, there is a look that tells you you know, that, that's, that's really far from what Islam says. And they're like hyped up. Alhamdulillah, I hope insha'Allah, it was a way to learn about their deen. So brothers and sisters, we have, alhamdulillah, the belief of Allah in the most balanced and logical 
a way that fits with our instinct and our minds and our hearts. Okay, what about luck? We can say good luck. We can say bad luck. We say, you know, lucky. But that's just a figure of speech. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ No one receives the goodness of paradise except he who is fortuned. And also in Arabic you can translate it as luck. But it depends what you mean. If luck is in itself an entity, it just does what it does, like it's a god or something, then no. This is disbelief in God. But if you say luck is just something that we cannot understand, it just happened. You know how they say in common words, it is what it is. Why? It is what it is. It happens. Such is life. That's how we kind of say it, right? Because we don't know more than that. But all that is controlled by Allah. We just call it luck because we don't know what it is. But as a Muslim, if you say luck, always say it. It's better not to say it, but if you want to say it, say fortune or misfortune. But if you want to say luck, say it in the meaning of that Allah is in control of something that I cannot comprehend and understand. But I'm going to accept it and move forward because Allah only does good and wise things. Next question. Do we believe in what goes around comes around? You know, that if you do something, sooner or later, it's going to do a ripple effect and it's going to come back at you. Or it's going to come back. All right, we see this on YouTube. Somebody does this. I don't want to say the name. They say karma's a, a this or that, right? Karma came back. Again, karma in itself is not a god. It has no intelligence, no ability, nothing. It's just a process of laws. You do this, that will happen. You put your hand in the fire, it will get burnt. Okay? If you mean like that karma, then okay, fine. But what goes around comes around. In Islam, part of it is true and part of it is not. Yes, it's not fixed and unchangeable though. So for example, if you do something sinful, some people say, be careful because Allah will bring it back into your family. If you do that, if you abuse that girl, then karma will bring back for someone to abuse your sister. Do we believe in that? No, we don't. Because when you say that, it's as if you're saying God is unjust and unfair. He punishes your sister because you went and did something wrong to another girl. You are the criminal. And she is the victim. Allah will not get an innocent person to make him the victim. There's nothing like that. And punishment is not really in this life. It's in the hereafter. But there are consequences to our actions which Allah has placed laws to. Now, if you got up in front of your family and you started to influence them to do wrong things and you kept on saying it and saying it and you influenced them, then yes, they're going to probably share in some of the consequences. But that's still your action. But we don't believe that what goes around comes around necessarily. Some things Allah stops them and they don't come back around. Such as if you repented to Allah. Such as if you changed your way. It doesn't mean that necessarily God's going to get you one day. <laughs> it, it doesn't happen. Allah is merciful. We all make mistakes. That means we're all doomed here. There's nothing left. Everybody makes mistakes. That ant that you accidentally stepped on or you deliberately stepped on, you're finished because of that ant. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgives. You may do some other work that takes care of this work. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching all things. And inshallah, we're going to talk about some things that look like they're changing qadr, they're changing predestiny. So we're going to talk about that. Another question of confusion that comes to mind is, if Allah knows what we were going to do, why did he create us? I get this question all the time. Well, if Allah knew where we're going to end up and where we're going to go, why create us? Well, it depends what you mean by that question. Last week we addressed it. If you mean to say by that question, if you mean... Why, uh, what was the motive of God himself to create us when he knew where we're going to go? The answer to that is not given to us. Allah says, لا يسأل عن شيء وهم يسألون. Allah cannot be questioned about what he does. You can't comprehend what he does. You can't. And we gave the analogy of the baby going to the fire and you trying to explain to the baby. 
And then the baby questioning you, the baby will never understand why you prevent them from going to the fire. Same with Allah. There is a wisdom. But if you mean by that question, why did Allah create us on earth here and not just create us dead and in the hereafter and put us in paradise and hellfire and not make us go through this whole world since he knows, then there is an answer to that, alhamdulillah, in the Quran and Sunnah. Why did Allah put us in the earth and not just put us straight into Jannah or hellfire since he knows? It's not for him. He put us here for us. One of God's name is that he is the fair and just. He will not just give you a consequence of reward or punishment without allowing you to fully understand and have the opportunity to live through it first. Why? Because on the day of judgment, when the records are given out and your destiny is called out to you, based on what you've done in the past, you will not be able to say, Oh Allah, but I didn't do anything. And Allah will allow you to talk. And there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, I just forgot where the source of it was, authentic, where he says, Nobody will enter hellfire until they are convinced they deserve it. Allah will not put you until a messenger comes to you and you know. So it's a two-way thing. But if he doesn't create you in this world and you end up there, you're going to say, but why Allah? I didn't do anything. I'll give you an example. I'm a teacher and sometimes when we give exams, I give them this, okay, so not sometimes, we give exams. And if I told a student, if your teacher told you, listen, uh, so-and-so, you don't need to do the test. You don't need to do the exam. And they say, why? Say, because, look, I'm just going to fail you because I already know you're going to fail. I'm your teacher. I've been watching you for years. You're going to fail. What are you going to say? What's your natural response as a student? Huh? I didn't get a chance. Come on, sir. So if he's a fair and kind teacher, he'll say, okay, sit the exam. You finish the exam, guess what? You failed. Did the teacher make you fail? No, he knew that you were going to fail, right? So, but now the difference is, when he tells you, or she tells you, you failed, what can you say? Fair enough. I understand. Now you know your teacher is fair and good. And knowledgeable. Same with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will not let you pass through everything until he gives you the opportunity, because as humans, we need, it is fair for us to see. Even in court, in, in law, before they sentence you to anything, they read out. They read out what the accusation is, what he convicted of. They make it very clear, do you understand? So it's fair for you to understand what's going on. Understand now? So we go through it. My brothers and sisters, next question of confusion comes up now. We said last week that it is up to us to choose the guidance Allah has given us or not. You can choose to obey God or disobey God. Right or wrong? Allah told you, be honest, you lied. Allah said to you, uh, don't lie, you obeyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't steal, you stole. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't steal, you chose not to steal, you, you obeyed Allah. And so on. Treat your wife good, you treated your wife good. Or you abused her. Or you treated your husband good. Or you abused him. It goes both ways, by the way. huh? I'm fair. Brothers and sisters, and the list goes on. You, you, you were good to your parents. Allah says, be good to your parents. You ended up being bad. The parents, Allah says, be, you are entrusted with your children. Either they fulfilled it or they abused their children. We have choice, correct? And we said, okay then. If that's the case, then how do we explain the verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says... وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَآمَنَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهُمْ جَمِيعًا أَفَأَنْتَ تُكْرِهُ النَّاسَ حَتَّى يَكُونُوا مُؤْمِنِينَ So the meaning of the verse is, and if your Lord willed it, if, in your, if your Lord willed it, all of the people on the earth would have believed and obeyed. If Allah willed it, all of the people on earth would have believed and obeyed. O oh, you, Muhammad, 
Are you, are you responsible to force people to be believers? You are not a forcer. If Allah willed, He would have made them all believers. What's the meaning of this verse? It's quite clear, but some people still confuse it. It means, if Allah wanted to, He would have made everyone believers by force without their choice. But did Allah will that? No, He didn't. Out of His mercy and justice, He did not will that. He willed the opposite. He willed that everyone can make their own choice if they want to believe or not. And that's why He said, O oh Muhammad, you haven't been sent a forcer upon them. You don't oblige them. It's up to them. Do you understand that part? So Allah could have forced you into it. And then we would say, well then, there's no purpose in living. God just made us to live out whatever he wrote for us and that's it. We got no choice. We're just robots. But no, that's not the case. You have a choice. If Allah willed it, he would have not given you choice. But the opposite is true. Is that question answered? Is that clear? If that is clear, I'm going to bring up another verse of the Quran that can cause confusion to this. Allah says, It is he who wills for who is going to be guided, and it is he who wills who is going to be misguided. We just said before, if Allah willed it, it would have made everybody believers. Now the verse seems like it's contradicting. It says, if Allah wills, he would have guided you. Uh, sorry, as Allah says, he guides whoever he wills, and he misguides whoever he wills. That seems like a contradiction. We've returned back to the same origin. It means we are forced. We're robots. What is the answer to that? Again, it's a misunderstanding. What it means, it says, Allah gives the guidance for them to see and gives the misguidance for whomever he wants to see. Then, the choice afterwards is theirs. You either take the guidance Allah showed you clearly or you take the misguidance that Allah showed you clearly. He willed to show you guidance and he willed to show you misguidance. And he showed to some people more guidance than others, and he showed to some people misguidance more than others as he sees fit. The choice afterwards is yours, but you cannot outsmart Allah, nor can you outdo him in wisdom and fairness. So he is fair and wise in the way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given everybody the guidance and misguidance, really. And when he gives you guidance, it means he willed for you to have the guidance. Or he willed for you to see the misguidance. All depending on how he sees you. Who is fit to see this much? Who is fit to see that much? Do you understand? Now we have another problem. Allah says, Whomever Allah guides, no one can misguide. And whoever Allah misguides, no one can guide. What is the answer to that question? It means, Whomever Allah shows the guidance to, which is everybody, and whomever Allah shows the misguidance to, which is everybody, if you choose to take that guidance and you keep going down that line, no one can mislead you after that because you are going down the guidance of God. If you continue that way, nothing can misguide you. If you take the misguidance, which Allah said don't go, and you keep going down that path and you keep going and going and going, well, if that's your choice, then nothing's going to guide you. Understood? It's similar to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, Whoever has no shame, do whatever you want. Meaning nothing can convince you otherwise. You have no shame. There's no shame. It's like a person who says, So what if we walk around nude? What's the big deal? You have no shame. So what if I steal? I'm just taking property. Everybody else steals. You have no shame. So what if everybody sleeps with everyone and you get abortions and we... You have no shame. You have no dignity. You, you are not a human. You, your humanity is empty. You're not dignified. These are just words. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, okay, if you keep going down that line, what's going to guide you? <laughs> Again, it's your choice, my brothers and sisters. Your choice. 
Finally, there are those whom Allah seals their hearts and blinds their spiritual vision if he knows they have been given every chance but they choose one thing. They choose arrogance over sincerity. Who has the choice of being arrogant or sincere? You or Allah? You. So you have your actions and you have your heart. Some people, I'll give you an example. We're giving a class right now, alhamdulillah, about qada and qadr. Some people, you, you have chosen to come here today. You chose to come here today. You have entered this class. All good. But there's something inside your heart I don't know. Only Allah knows. If you entered from that door to sit here with an arrogant heart, so if you've come in here, let's say someone came in here, just to hear what I say in order to respond, in order to put doubts, in order to take it away and confuse people with it, that's an arrogant person. Allah is not going to show him the guidance. Because he or she has chosen not to accept the guidance, Allah will not force the guidance on that person. But if you entered this room with an open heart, and you're sincere, and you want to give yourself a chance to learn, Allah will open the guidance for you to see. Because you've made the choice to want it. You made the choice to want it. You may sit at night and lift your arms up to Allah when no one is around. And you say, my Lord, I'm lost. Oh Allah, guide me. On condition you ask the one true God. You don't ask Buddha. You don't ask, uh, what's it, um, uh, you don't ask uh, Jesus. You don't ask Moses. You don't ask the angels. You don't ask Muhammad. You don't ask uh, the idols. You don't ask Jupiter. Right? You don't ask the zodiac signs. You don't ask Nisha. You don't ask all those other people. You ask Allah. And you really want guidance? Allah will open the doors for you. Anyone who asks Allah for guidance sincerely, Allah will guide them. Anyone who doesn't want it? Misled. Remember the story of Iblis, the shaitan? The only reason Allah took him out of the rank which he had, he was a believer. But Allah told us that in his heart there was istikbar, istakbar. He became arrogant. So he could not see the light anymore. Instead, he became more evil. And he blamed God for it. Adam, Adam and Hawa, they also, they also made a mistake. They were forbidden from eat, eating from the tree in paradise, but he forgot. He forgot that it was forbidden. He's a human, and he ate from it forgetfully. When he made the mistake, he didn't blame God. He said, oh Allah, forgive us. We have made a mistake. Allah wasn't angry with them. But look at the difference. Iblis, arrogance, could not see the light, even though he was with the rank of the angels forever. Adam السلام, was only in Paris for about a few years, decades. He was just being born, just being created. Yet his heart was not arrogant. And so he saw the other side. And now we come to the question, okay, does this answer the question of the hadith where Allah says, the hearts of all of the children of Adam, all our hearts are between two fingers of my Lord. He flip-flops them in any direction he wills. Now when we say the two fingers, this is... Yeah, and it, we're not describing Allah as having two fingers like a human. The Prophet ﷺ said this, but what it means is that Allah is, say, the Prophet ﷺ is saying that Allah has control over our hearts. He can make them go in the right direction or in the wrong direction. What is the answer to that? We say, when you want the guidance, Allah leans your heart towards the guidance. When you want the misguidance, Allah leans your heart towards the misguidance. Have you ever been in a situation where in the beginning you didn't want to do bad things? You did then you your friends influenced you, then you thought I'll do one. You did that one, you thought, oh, I didn't get a lightning strike. God didn't give me a lightning bolt a bolt. Uh, I'll do a second one. Oh, I got a bit of attention. I enjoyed it. Do a third one, fourth one. Now you start liking the sin. What's happening to the heart? Allah is allowing it to lean towards the haram now. But then you change around. You repent to Allah and then you start, first you don't want to come to the masjid, first you don't want to pray, then you start doing it, then you say, I'm going to do it, I've made the decision. First time, second time, then suddenly your heart begins to love it. 
It happens. So this is what it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you want the guidance, Allah helps you by making your heart lean towards the guidance. When you don't want the guidance, Allah makes your heart lean towards the misguidance. But you still have a conscience. You can always wake up. My brothers and sisters, there is a question now that the companions asked the Prophet, peace be upon him. They said, O Messenger of Allah, everything God wrote and willed, is it definite, absolute, unchangeable and gone in the past? Or is there some of it that God will write in the future that's not written yet? He responded, Allah has already written everything and everything is precisely measured and done till the end of time. Already gone. So then they came with the question, then, O oh Messenger of God, what's the point of doing anything? Why work? Why pray? Why fast? Why do good? Just sit there and wait until whatever God has written comes. But the Prophet ﷺ replied, and I think I've already answered it, but this will just reinforce it. He said, I'malu. No, 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 no. You have to act. You have to do. Why? فكل, he said, I'malu. Uh, فَكُلٌّ مُيَسَّرٌ لِمَا خُلِقَ لَهُ أَمَّا أَهْلُ السَّعَادَةِ فَيُيَسَّرُونَ لِعَمَلِ أَهْلِ السَّعَادَةِ وَأَمَّا أَهْلُ الشَّقَاوَةِ فَيُيَسَّرُونَ لِعَمَلِ أَهْلِ الشَّقَاوَةِ He said, act and do. It's not like that. For if Allah, I'll just give you the interpretation. For if Allah knows already that you are going to choose and work towards paradise in your life, he will ease the pathway to it. He will create the means for you because you've already made the decision. And if he knows that you are going to work and choose the pathway of hellfire, he will also ease the pathway for you. It is up to you. So Allah wrote what he knows you will choose. And then he created the means for you to go. Completely your choice. That's why some people, they say, wow, why is it that all these people, they're doing all this bad, this bad, this bad, and their businesses are going so well? Bad, 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 and it looks like their marriage is going so well. Bad, 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 and their education is so well, or their wealth is so well, and I don't know what, and they're driving a great car. No, ya akhi, no. We don't measure it like that. How do you know? Maybe this person has made the decision to the pathway of hellfire, so Allah said, I will ease whatever you want. But everything you do is on your way to the fire. And what's going to happen to all that business and wealth? Allah says, Kullu man alayha fan. Everything upon it is going. But just in case, on the day of judgment, here's a little bit of kindness to you. Since you chose this pathway, I let you enjoy the worthless life. You got what you wanted. Because I don't oppress anyone. That's what Allah says in the Quran. Allah does not oppress anyone. Do you understand? Same. A person is doing good, 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 and all you see is having misery in life. Meaning, what we see, we think that his marriage is not going well, we think that their car is not nice, their wealth is not nice, their business is not going well. How do you know? That person could be very happy and content inside that you can never ever dream of, no matter how much money you have. But... Their pathway, even with all these struggles, God knows why they're going through that struggle. There is a reason. Perhaps if he gave him, maybe he'll lose it. Maybe he'll lose the way. God knows. He's on his way, but at the end, he's on the right path. He's, gonna, he's working towards paradise. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad wasallam was sitting in his house one time, and his house was very, very humble. Umar radiallahu anhu enters. He sits. The Prophet wasallam let him enter. He sits down smiling. Then after about five minutes, he looks around, starts crying. Omar is crying. He said, Ma yubkika, ya Omar, what's making you cry, ya Omar? He said, Ya Rasulullah, the kings of Persia are reclining on silk and pearls and gold and they're eating from the most exquisite meals. The kings of Rome, the kings of Egypt, and you, ya Rasulullah, the best of creation. Look at your state. A bit of barley that hasn't been prepared. A bowl, I don't know what's in it. A little lantern 
of you know to light up your your light you got no fuel in it your bed it's a thin tiny layer of mattress it's not even a mattress it's straw and your pillow is coarse i can see the marks of the straw on your body ya rasulullah and you are like this <laughs> the prophet sallallahu said don't say that ya umar ala yurdika anna lahum anna lana al janna wa lahum an ala yurdika anna lahum al dunya wa lana al akhirah is it not enough for you that they all they're going to get is this world and we get the hereafter it doesn't matter and by the way the prophet sallallahu wasn't poor because he chose to be poor he was poor because his wealth was always given he gave it he didn't say we don't have to live like that of course you can live in luxury if you want but don't forget and don't let your heart be misguided be very careful with that i'll do two more problems and then we'll end inshallah ta'ala <clears throat> answered this one okay what if someone brings up the authentic hadith that says the prophet peace be upon him said i swear by the almighty allah the one who possesses my soul in his hands you could be spending your entire life working in goodness and righteousness until if you died at that moment there will be only a palm length between you and paradise you're about to get there and then before your death you change around and you end up among the people of the fire and it could be that you're doing the opposite you do bad all your life until there is a palm length between you and hell fire and then before your death you change and you do the acts of the actions of the people of paradise and you end up in paradise how is that fair how is that fair the guy lived all his life in sin ends up in paradise the other one lives his life doing all that good ends up in hell fire this is explained with another hadith you can't just take one hadith explained in another hadith prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says in another hadith with a, with a word added he or she does good to what appears to you is good but what is in secret which you don't know about them they've always been doing the acts of the people of the fire but in front of you you don't see it perhaps it's in their heart maybe not in their bedroom at home perhaps it's in their heart you don't know and the person who's doing sins all their life you don't know their secrets either perhaps there is some secret act they're doing that you don't know about that Allah because of that he's forgiving perhaps in their heart they're just confused they're struggling they've got a mental illness they've suffered they've been abused they haven't had someone to guide them they haven't been able to receive knowledge they want it but their hearts are good and then allah finally they see the guidance they take it and they go for it and end up people of of jannah but what we see what we see you see they say you don't know a person until you test them you know a person until you deal with them in money you don't know a person until you go into a business partnership with them you don't know a person until you go on a travel with them isn't that right until you live with them isn't that correct to us we're all beautiful but what do we know about each other that allah knows that person who is sinning he could be every night sitting ya rab crying when are you going to take away this wall that is between me and you When is this going to end ya rab I need your guidance how do you know So my brothers and sisters Allah is arham ar rahimin he knows more than us I think I mentioned this last week And lastly Aha <clears throat> uh-huh. I'll answer this one inshallah I got this question asked the other day Are the outcomes of things the outcomes you do something and there's an outcome is that outcome also in our choice this is a very good question i'll tell you why you're driving and you decided to speed you hit a car god forbid that had several people in there one of them died 
One of them was severely injured. And one of them, nothing happened to him or her. Are you responsible? You're responsible. Are you accountable? You're accountable. How much are you accountable? That's another question. In the law with the judge, that's one thing. And with Allah, it's another. Allah knows maybe you forgot. Maybe you didn't mean it. Maybe you were not negligent. Maybe you were negligent. Depends. Allah is fair. But you are responsible. Our question here is the outcome. If it was your choice, would you choose that outcome? No. But it happened, correct? You are responsible for the action you did. You are very aware of the possible consequence of speeding. Is that correct? If you were holding your phone, you are aware of the possible danger that can happen as a result of looking at your phone. Are you aware or not aware? You are aware. Did you speed or not speed? Were you negligent or not? Okay. The outcome is not in your hands. That is in Allah's hands. You might ask, but it's not my fault they died. It is. It's just that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed them to die and for you to be responsible for it at that moment. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them die for other reasons as well. The point of the matter is, you are the cause and your cause was because of your own choice. And your choice was based on pure knowledge. Your choice was based on knowing the dangers. The degree of how much it's your fault is another answer. Allahu alam. It's another question. It could be a lot, could be a little bit. But the point is you hold accountability. But the outcome is always Allah's. Have you seen accidents that look like everybody would have been completely disintegrated? But they come out walking like nothing happened to them? Who chose that outcome? Allah also chose that outcome. But we kind of focus on the bad rather than the good. We focus on the bad. As soon as bad happens, why, why, why? But do you know how many millions of times this bad could have happened but Allah prevented it? Why don't we count all the good as well? Because that's the nature of humans. <laughs> and Allah tells us, you know, I know you do not know. What do we do in that case? Perhaps Allah had a plan. Perhaps it was a test for your hereafter. Perhaps good is going to come out of it. And perhaps you're going to learn from your choice a big lesson. Perhaps, had this not happened, something greater was going to happen. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Subhanallah. The other day, I had to do a marriage up in Sydney. Someone called me, can you please come and do the marriage? I said, brother, please, it's going to cost you a lot of money. The aeroplane, the hotel, the fee, the this, the that, come on. Just get a sheikh from there. I'll, I want you to do it. I said, okay, my pleasure. Book me a ticket. Another person had another marriage here in Melbourne. A little few hours before them, I said, all right, I'll do it. Suddenly, outside of my control, the flight was brought forward. It was cancelled, brought forward. You know how it's happening at the moment. Now I had to cancel the marriage here. Called them up. I called the first celebrant. He's busy. Called the second celebrant. It was his risk. It was his. He went and did it. I couldn't do it. Got on the aeroplane. On my way to Sydney. Wallahi. They said, for the, I, I've travelled over... Allah, maybe a hundred times. They said, we have an engineering fault in the plane. The door, something's wrong with it. We disembarked. It was a big problem. Flight cancelled. <laughs> Called the brother up. Let's see another flight. Let's see. No. All the other flights are too late. Called up another celebrant in Sydney. It was his risk. He went and did it. And I paid $36 for the taxi. <laughs> I called up my nephew to pick me up. He's asleep. Called up my second nephew to pick me up. Wallahi. He says, oh, come, Ammo. Comes, has an accident. Subhanallah. How do we explain that? The rizq was not mine. I tried, but it's out of my hands. The accident, my nephew didn't know. Had he known, he wouldn't come that way. Khalas. 
in these situations, we don't know. It's a mystery. You do what you can. The outcome is Allah's. However, what was my intention? What was my objective? Remember we talked about that last week? Allah rewards you based on your intention and objective. Right there and then, I changed my intention. And I said, Alhamdulillah, I'm happy for paying for the taxi. I made dua for the celebrant who took that one and dua for the celebrant who did that one. And Wallahi, I was genuinely happy for them after that dua. In every sense of it. I felt amazing like I had earned $50,000 from this. Why did I say $50,000? Why couldn't I have said $100,000? $100,000. Brothers and sisters, in these circumstances, a mu'min is patient and gives in, says, Alhamdulillah, ala sarra'i wa darra, good and bad. There's always something good will come out, inshallah. Allahu a'lam, those 300, 200 passengers on there, what each of their fate was going to be by being cancelled. It's not just me in this life. Allahu a'lam. You understand, my brothers and sisters? The outcome is in Allah's hands. The choice and the objective and the intention is yours. What comes out in the end? You accept and say, Alhamdulillah. Good or bad, keep moving forward. And I recited the verse here, and I'll finish it with that in the uh, Salat in Aisha. Allah says in Surah Al-Hadid, سَابِقُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ Race each other to a forgiveness from your Lord and a paradise. عَرْضُهَا كَعَرْضِ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ its vastness is like all the skies and all the earths and all the planets, everything. It has been prepared for those who believe and put their trust in Allah and His messengers. Further on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, next verse, He says, لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ Do not despair over the things that passed you and you didn't get. Don't despair over the things that passed you and you didn't get the fortune. And do not rejoice too much. Don't sit there, not rejoice. Don't feel too proud over the things that you did get. Allah doesn't like every person who flip-flops between acts of hypocrisy. One minute he loves me, one minute he doesn't. One minute he's grateful, one minute he doesn't depend on what I give him, what I don't. Fakhur. It's always boastful, thinks he, he deserves everything. Don't be one of those people. And this verse really lets us calm down. You went to the auction, you bid on the car, you didn't get it. man, you just sit there for hours, some people. They even fight. Yeah, it wasn't yours. Brother, can you help me out? You get another brother. Once I went to buy a house, a long time ago. There's, There's 40 people there. How many? About 40 people. One other Muslim. Me and another Muslim. The rest, non-Muslims, 40. This Muslim saw no one else except me to come and try to manipulate me not to buy the house. What about the other 38 people? <laughs> it's amazing. Look at that house over there. There's trouble over there. You, you know, trying to put me off. I go, la hawla wa la quwwata. How do you even know we're even going to... You know what? Wallahi, we went even a drop... <laughs> Next to what other people offered. But this, may Allah forgive this brother. He earned the sin by saying that. And we weren't even, Allah, it wasn't even written at all. Nowhere near it. And he went, you know, 400 times more than what we could afford. So my brothers and sisters, yani, subhanallah, uh, Make your choices right. Remember you'll be questioned. Do the right thing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what you get out of it, alhamdulillah. Take cause and effect. Work with conditions. You know, you don't just sit there saying whatever Allah wrote. No, work. You have to keep going. You have to do what you can. You have to plan. But when things don't go your way, say, don't say, if only I had done so and so, this and that would have happened. How do you know? How can you possibly know? 
forget about the past, learn from any mistakes you made, now move forward. That's what Allah says. This is not something you learn from experts on YouTube. Brothers and sisters, this is in the Quran. Move forward. But keep Allah by your side. That's the only difference. Be optimistic. Be positive. Try again. Keep going. Soon we'll all go back to Allah. My brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and benefit you and us with this knowledge. Next week, inshallah, I think the two more lessons on this and I'll have finished all the questions I have. Uh, I have more questions that I haven't talked about today, inshallah. And uh, I'll give you five minutes if you want, if anyone who needs to leave. I'm sorry your backs are broken. Some of you probably can't feel your feet anymore. What can I say to you? First, I'm sorry. And secondly, قَدَّرَ Allah wa مَا شَاءَ فَعَلْ Allah willed and what He wills, He does. You'll get better, inshallah. It's all fi sabilillah. How's that? <laughs> Any questions, brothers and sisters? Yep. Brother is asking actually a question which I was going to talk about today, but now I have to... I was going to leave it till next class. But it doesn't matter. Brother is asking, how do you reconcile between qada and qadar and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which says, nothing repels qadar except for dua. If you do dua, it, the Prophet ﷺ said, it can repel a predestination. The hadith, majority of scholars say it's authentic. Some say it's weak. But there are other hadiths that are authentic that mean the same thing. Such as the one where Prophet ﷺ said, whoever connects their family ties and is good to his or her parents, oh, sorry, it says, whoever wants their sustenance to increase, their profit, and their lifespan to be longer, then connect your family ties and be good to your parents. And then he said, and nothing changes qadar except for dua the answer is very simple the fact that you were good to your parents and you chose to connect your family ties and you made dua was already in the qadar <laughs> Allah knew that you were gonna make the dua that will change an already qadar but that doesn't answer everything I'll tell you how it works remember in the beginning when I told you, there is a book of decree. Everything is in it. Nothing changes. And then there are angels who take the orders from that book of decree bit by bit when it's about to be passed down. So for example, someone will be born. Now's the time Allah sends that angel. Someone will die. Hasn't happened yet. He sends the angel with that order. That qadar which the angels have, is some of it is absolute and some of it is called mu'allaq, which means conditional. So there are two ajals, there are two qadars. The one in the book of decree is absolute, and the angels have a conditional qadar. The angels don't know it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes to manifest the beauty of his servants to his angels as well. So the angel is going to take your life, let's say, at the age of 60. That's what the angel of death knows. Then Allah sends a decree and says, stop. Stop. You would probably have, have an accident, let's say, God forbid, you're going to die from it. The angel says, stop. You have the accident, you don't die, you survive. Allah had changed what the angel thought was going to happen. And Allah will say, the book of decree overcomes the decree I gave you. It's already written, but it just wasn't released. Until that person does that good deed. Allah says, that person lived a life where his parents were pleased with him or her. And he was good to them. And he was patient. Even with their harshness, he was patient. Angel of death, I have extended his life. It was already written another 40 years. And I'm going to give him sustenance. His superannuation is going to be better. Do you understand? So this is called Ajal Mu'allaq and Ajal 
muhkam, a decree that is final and a decree that is conditional. Same with the dua. Allah knew you're going to make dua. Do I have evidence for this? Yes, I have evidence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Yamhu Allah ma yasha'u wa... I'll explain it. Yamhu Allah ma yasha'u. Allah can erase anything He wants, any decree that was supposed to happen. Wa yuthbit, and He can make firm what decree He wants. وَعِنْدَهُ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ And with him is the book of all books, the decree, the origin, the source. What does that mean? The ulama said it means some decree is about to happen, the angels think it's going to happen. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the book of decree already knew this, it's changed. The book of decree said it was going to change. Allah knew you were going to make dua. Allah knew you were going to do that. So then this was going to happen and it was changed. Why does Allah do that? Because He wants us to be motivated. He wants us to make dua. It's the opposite of why we say, it's already written, I'm sure, why should I do it? No, so that you can make dua. See, this motivates you. Don't ask me how. It's so complicated and complex beyond our perceivable mind. It's, it's beyond us. But everything is in its place perfectly. And Allah knows. That's it. So when you make dua, for example, in the morning you wake up, and the Prophet ﷺ taught us dua of the morning. Get the book, brothers and sisters. Read the dua of the mornings. It's beautiful. For example, Rasul ﷺ used to say, Oh Allah, I ask you of the goodness of this day, and I seek refuge in you from the badness of this day. The fact that you made that dua could be the reason that if something bad was going to happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do one of three things. You ready for it? This, I'm, I'm, I'm literally saying the hadith, which is in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ, he told us that when you make a dua, the dua goes up into the heavens to be responded to at the time that it was supposed to be responded to. Why was it with another qadr was with the angels? Because the dua hasn't been made yet. The order was already given. Then the dua comes. Rasul ﷺ said, and the decree is coming down. And they meet halfway. He says, فَيَتَصَارَعَانَ they begin to wrestle your dua and the bad decree. They wrestle. If your dua was stronger, came out really strong from you. It fights off the entire qadr until nothing is left of it. If your dua was weaker, the qadr comes down, but with a new qadr, weaker than the old one. Some of it happens. For example, you were destined to cross the road to school and get run over by a car. God forbid. You were supposed to break two legs and have a damaged kidney. But because of your dua, the car just nipped you. You didn't break anything. You just got a little bit of bruises. That's a dua that was not Stronger than the Qadr completely, but, the qadr, but it weakened the Qadr. Or, Rasul said, it equals the Qadr. They keep wrestling till the, till the day of judgment. Neither this happens nor that. My brothers and sisters, that is why Allah, Prophet said, مَن لَمْ يَسْأَلِ اللَّهِ يَغْضَبْ عَلَيْهِ Whoever does not ask Allah, make dua to Allah, Allah gets angry with you. That's the only time I loved the anger of God. Ask Him, talk to Him. Otherwise, Allah will be angry with you. Why aren't you talking to Allah? Opposite of humans. We'll talk about that next week, inshallah, and continue from here. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Allah yahfazkum.